For anybody who is here for the Jester Show, is to come up this way a little bit, as we'll be mostly performing in this general sort of a direction. There's plenty of space back there in the second row. That's a lovely row. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Thank <laughs> you. 
Let's go make it up to you. <laughs> Best seats in the house. <laughs> oh, no, you get a bonus trick for that. Two bonus tricks. There we go. <laughs> Now Rob, your next task 
to me to lie down upon the tasseled blanket of impending doom. <laughs> what a natural laugh. <laughs> now, Rob, do you have any children? Good, that's done then. <laughs> now, um, we're going to keep our feet together, hands in place, that's great. Now, Alan's going to get the props that I need for this trick. Um, Alan, if you'd like to bring those over. Myself, we're about to Balls of my own 
two human hands. Around you. There will be a club flag in front of your face like this. 
Instinctively, you'll want to lean back. Do not do that, Elliot and Lydia, because there'll be another club flying behind your head like this. And if anything, that's the one to worry about, because that's the one Alan was throwing. The wind's coming from that direction. Now, we'll just do um, five passes? Yeah, five. Five. five you guys can count to five. We all know five, don't we? <laughs>
Liam. introduce you now to um, a bird that you may actually have seen in many other bird of prey displays, but one that is truly underestimated, the Harris's hawk. This is Buddy. Now, Harris's hawks, by the way, their name is Harris's, not Harris, all right? Um, if I say Harris, feel free to call them out and tell me that I've got it wrong. He is a Harris's hawk, um, not Harris. Uh, if he was a Harris hawk, he would have had to have been discovered by Mr. Harris, but that, I'm afraid, was not the case. Uh, Mr. Harris was extremely rich, uh, but he did not go on the expedition to the Americas to find this bird himself. Instead, he paid someone else to do it. And what that meant then was when he tried to claim the naming rights, they told him no. So he was quite clever about it. What he did was he said, well, okay, well, if I can't call it the Harris hawk, I'll name it as if it belongs to me, the Harris's hawk. Um, so it was a little bit of a loophole, but a fantastic one at that. So you'll see the books, the internet, even some of the signage around zoos and wildlife and falconry centres will say Harris Hawk, but I'll tell you that is wrong. Now this is one of the truly most fantastic birds of prey that we work with, purely because whilst we're only flying one of them here today, they're an extremely social species. This is something we very rarely see in the bird of prey world. Normally, they are solitary creatures. But Harris hawks live and hunt communally. They want to uh, encourage other family members to be around them when they're searching for food. So, of course, the more birds, the more teeth, uh, sorry, teeth, the more beaks and the more talons you have. So, these guys uh, actively encourage their youngsters to learn how to hunt alongside them. Now, in terms of, of a group, of course, there's a couple of things you need. First of all, you need a leader. Now, out here today, Buddy's leader is actually Ross, the falconer. You always spot Ross because you just have to look at the colour of his hair, all right? <laughs> now, Ross is in charge here, but as wild as he looks, he does, not look, uh, he does not live in the dry, arid regions of Central America. So he can't look after these birds in the wild. In the wild, it turns to the females. In bird of prey world, we see something called sexual dimorphism. Uh, and that's essentially a difference between the sexes, and it's normally size. In Harris hawks, the females can be up to 33% larger. And if you're that big, you're the weapon of choice. So, the females then employ the males to chase the food towards them. The smaller males will push through thicket, the grass, the bushes, and when the females spot the prey, she will make the kill. But remember, she's the leader, she's in charge, so she's the one that's going to feed first. She eats, she then may feed some of her chicks on the nest, she might even allow other family members to feed. But you know who she doesn't let eat? The smaller males that she's employed to work with her. She starves them, <laughs> um, which I will say is something that does not work as well for humans, alright? But she does, she starves them, doesn't let them eat, until she is completely done with them and no longer needs their help. The other way, of course, that she shows that she is in control of this group of males is not just by starving, but also when they go to sleep. Imagine living in the Arizona desert. There's not a whole lot in the way of trees to go to sleep in. So these guys will often uh, roost on cactus. Now, cactus don't make a particularly comfortable bed. They're quite prickly. Now, the smaller males, this isn't much of a problem for. They've got small, skinny feet that allow them to put their toes in between the long, sharp spines. The females, however, they're much bigger, and therefore it doesn't work so well for them. So they've learned a little trick. They don't sleep on the cactus. They wait for the males to go to bed first, and they sleep on top of them. This gave them the wonderful nickname of the Stacking Hawk, and the world record for a stack of Harris's hawks in the wild stands at seven birds tall. Six smaller males and one, which I imagine was an extremely smug female. Now we also believe that this is where the inspiration for the totem pole came from, used by the Native American tribes. Uh, you see that stack of birds with the one on the top with the wings open, maintaining that balance. Now, 
Yes, OK, a group does need a leader, but they also need communication. And whilst you're out on the hunt, what you can't afford to do is communicate in your normal squeaks, walks um, uh, and screams. So the Harris Talks have actually developed a unique way of communicating via sign language. Now, when Buddy lands with somewhere that is not on our gloves, he will signal to us where he is by wagging his tail. So keep an eye out as he's flying around today, you'll see him wagging that tail. And it is because he is using the very tips of those tail feathers, the white tips along the edge of those dark feathers to wave to us, to catch the light from the sun and signal to us or to that female in the wild his position. It is believed that there could be as many as 30 different ways that Harris's hawks uh, communicate via wagging their tail. A single wag is, this is where I am. Multiple wags could mean this is where food is. It could mean change position. A huge variety of communications, which makes them really, truly unique in the bird of prey world. But I did say they are incredible hunters. So communal work, helping each other out, communicating silently all means that they make extremely successful hunting birds. Now yes, we can hunt with these in the UK on uh, small birds or we could even hunt anything really up to the size of a rabbit. Um, in the wilds of Central America we have seen Harris's hawks able to take down things the size of a jackrabbit which is about the size of a European hare. So as we have Buddy with us here today Ross, I think we should do something pretty special. I think this crowd is quite able to deal with a little bit of excitement from a bird like this. So we are gonna show you now one of the most incredible hunting tactics of a Harris's hawk. He is not, able, not just able to hunt food on the floor, but he's also able to successfully hunt food from the sky. So once he takes flight over Ross's head, food goes up, he stands on his tail, captures the food and takes it down to land. And you all erupted into spontaneous round of applause. The fact that I had to tell them to clap Ross, I don't think they were impressed enough. Should we go up one more? Should we big it up even more? All right then, let's step it up. That obviously wasn't exciting enough for you. How about a live action hunt right here in the arena? Ooh. Fantastic. Underneath our van, shut away in a cage, currently necking Red Bulls and doing star jumps, is Bernard the Bunny. In a moment's time, we are gonna release Bernard. He is gonna sprint at high speed across our arena. Buddy is gonna uh, jump into action. He's gonna swoop down, he's gonna capture the prey in a live action hunt in front of you all. Do you wanna see that? Yeah. Fantastic. Audience, are you ready? Ross, are you ready? Is Bernard ready? Let's give him a countdown from three. You ready? Three, two, one. And they're off! And he's already caught! <laughs> Who thought it was going to be more exciting than that? <laughs> for those of you that can't see, oh, thank you very much. Uh, for those of you that can't see, Bernard is not a real bunny. He is, in fact, a dummy bunny, um, dragged by Ross to imitate that live action hunt from you. But, just like our falcon, he does need to give up the bunny. So Ross has to make that trade with food, and then he could, if that was a real rabbit, take that home and feed himself with it, couldn't he? But an incredible bird, an incredible display. Give it up for Buddy, our Harris's hawk. Excellent job. Now, Ross, I've forgotten. Oh, hang on. Ross, is it this one? That one, thought so, lovely. So, we're gonna move on. A day like today, isn't this beautiful, by the way? Massively unexpected. I've been moaning all morning that I didn't bring my sunglasses out because it said it was gonna be overcast. Now, I shouldn't complain because it is an absolutely wonderful day for flying birds, uh, but still, it's making me squint. Uh, but today, with this beautiful sunlight and the breeze that we've got, it's an absolutely brilliant day for flying a kite. So, 
we are going to introduce you to Bramble. Bramble is a member of the kite family. And you may see he has got a bright yellow bill and therefore he is an imaginarily named the yellow-billed kite. This is an African uh, species. This is uh, a very similar species to the red kite that you'll see back above our heads today. We've seen many of them. Um, and it is uh, not unusual to see multiple red kites stacking up in the skies above us. And these birds do exactly the same thing. The red kite is the largest of the kite family. Uh, these guys much smaller and are more brown in colour rather than the typical rusty red coloration. But just like our red kites, they are scavengers. These birds have broad wings, small bodies and teeny little feet. So they are not designed to hunt large prey items like the Harris's hawk. Instead, they scavenge for food. However, in Africa, you're not going to be the only scavenger as a kite. There is an entire queue of animals. Uh, you've got the lions, the hyenas, the crocodiles, the eagles, and most famously, the vultures. So by the time a small bird like Bramble got to the carcass, there's not going to be a whole lot of food left. So they've slightly changed tactics. They still use the carcass, but they instead hunt on the insects that gather around that carcass. So to demonstrate this, Ross is going to throw bits of food up in the air and Bramble is going to stand on his tail to catch them. Look at this. Uh, and I will say, by the way, it's raw chicken going in the air. If Ross gets close to the barrier, shoo him away. Because I have incredible belief in my uh, yellow-billed kite's eye to talon coordination, but I don't have the same confidence in Ross's throwing. Now, he is, uh, I'm talking about the bird again now, not Ross. <laughs> Bramble is incredibly energy efficient. Kites are designed to use very little energy whilst on the wing. In fact, if you watch him flying, he only expels energy when he flaps. Every single time his wings stay still, he is using no energy whatsoever. So the natural buoyancy, and he's using no energy when he sits on the ground. He's incredibly buoyant, he used that buoyancy to ride the air rather than have to create that movement himself. But conserving the energy goes further than that for kites. The yellow-billed kite is doing something very special after it catches the food. So keep an eye on Bramble and watch as he catches a piece of food and what he does afterwards. Ready? Food goes up, he catches it and he immediately passed it from his talons to his beak. This bird is not just catching the food in the air, but he's then eating it whilst on the wing as well. He knows that if he catches an insect, lands, eats it and takes off again, he's wasted all the energy that that small piece of food has given him. So he will feed on the wing. Incredible aerial dynamics for a bird that is all about being energy efficient. Now, they do also feed on slightly larger items of prey, Catching insects works brilliantly if you are only feeding yourself. But if you have chicks on the nest, you need to catch things like uh, reptiles, rodents, and maybe the odd amphibian so that you can feed them. In which case they choose a different technique. A technique that we have labeled the snatch and grab. And I'm gonna make Ross demonstrate this today by sacrificing his fingers as our beautiful bramble swoops on down and snatches food straight out of his open palm. Now again, I said to you, I have confidence in eye talent coordination. Ross, you've got your fingers still, haven't you? See? Notice he only shows one hand. That's because I made him switch. <laughs> uh, but no, it's absolutely incredible eye to talent coordination, which allows them to not only hunt um, terrestrial animals, as I said, but also semi-aquatic or fully aquatic animals. There are kites that will snatch fish out of ponds, rivers and streams and lakes, quite literally taking them out of the surface. They won't plunge like the offspray, but they will snatch from the surface and continue to fly off with them. Just incredible in terms of using as little energy as possible. But I do want to tell you about a story that is linked to kites worldwide. Um, a story that it might seem hard to believe. Uh, it's a, a myth of the firehawk. 
a bird of prey that created fire wherever it flew, quite literally burning down whole settlements. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, as much as I would love, and I imagine Ross as well, would love to train and free fly a phoenix for you two today, I don't think it's going to happen. I'm not holding my breath. So it must be made up. There's no way that there is a bird of prey that can create fire. Or is there? Well, in 2019, 2019, uh, these birds were being filmed, uh, well, they're very similar cousins to these guys, the black kites, was being filmed feeding around wildfires, which this makes a lot of sense. Behind the fire, you've got lots of roasted dinners, and in front of the fire, you've got lots of fleeing animals, so there's plenty to choose from. And they were filming these birds, swooping down, as Bramble just did, snatching food off the surface of the ground. But accidentally, the BBC caught one of the most important pieces of footage that we have ever seen of kites. What they saw was the kites were swooping down and not picking up food, but picking up sticks. Yeah, that's the reaction I normally get. It's not massively impressive, is it? Birds pick up sticks all the time. All right, then let's one-up it, because these sticks were on fire. They were picking up burning sticks, carrying them to areas that are not yet caught alight, and dropping them, spreading the fire, increasing the area that they could hunt, uh, and spreading the uh, amount of food that was on opportunity. So if you thought this world wasn't bad enough as it is, we've got arsonist kites to deal with. However, we have got another bird to fly for you today. And arguably, I think it's one of the most important birds that we have brought with us. Uh, a face that only a mother could love. I'm going to introduce you to the beautiful Ronnie. And Ronnie is a turkey vulture. Give me a cheer if you love vultures. Excellent. That is exactly what I wanted to hear. Vultures on the whole are one of the most important species of bird of prey on our planet. They are quite literally nature's clean-up crew. He is feeding, or she is feeding on, the food that most other animals completely disregard. When you drop food on the floor, you might say, oh, I've got a five-second rule, quick, blow it and eat it, yeah? And none of you is going to admit it, but I all know you do it, all right? Some of you grow gross and go, ten-second rule. But that's okay, Ronnie's got more like a five-week rule. Okay, she does not care if that meat is fresh or whether it's putrefied and rotten. She will feed on any food that is available to her. She does this because she is perfectly designed to deal with rotting flesh. A stomach acid that can be anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 times stronger than our own. Ready to break down some of the most disgusting food out there. But more so than that because it's not just rotting flesh that she's capable of dealing with. She's also able to deal with meat that is infected with entire diseases, huge varieties, things like anthrax, botulism, typhoid, tuberculosis, um, the cold and flu viruses, the coronaviruses, salmonella, E. coli, huge amounts of, of diseases and bacteria. And quite literally, because of the strength of those stomach acids, she doesn't just digest the meat, but she eradicates those diseases within her system. So after she is eaten, what comes out of the other end of her is actually far cleaner than what went in the front. They are not just eating and clearing up the uh, environments for us, but they are quite literally cleaning the ground itself. It has been said that because of the strength of the stomach acids, that their feces does have antibacterial qualities. Pretty amazing stuff. Sadly though, vultures across the world are heavily persecuted. They are thought to be gross, disgusting, dangerous birds. And we have people like Mr. Walt Disney to thank for that. Where they've put, painted these birds in such horrible lights that they're no longer looked after in the wild. In fact, out of the 23 species of vulture found on our planet, 17 of them are now classed as endangered or critically endangered species. But hey, it's not all doom and gloom. There is things going on that help vultures out across the planet. Our organisation is one of them. Education is one of the most important things that we can offer you guys when talking about vultures. 
talking to you about how amazing they are and about how useful they are in the world, showing you that every single creature on our planet has a place and deserves to be there. But there are, of course, breed and release programs. There are uh, people setting up vulture-safe breeding and feeding zones where there is no contact with people whatsoever. Poachers are being properly prosecuted. Um, drugs that were once poisoning them are being banned. So huge amounts of work is being done to protect these species, and we only want that to continue. A little bit about turkey vultures, though. They are one of the most unique species of vultures simply down to how they locate their prey. As you can imagine, as a vulture feeding on rotting flesh, the very last thing you want to do is know what it smells like. Yeah? So most vultures throughout history have evolved to have lost their sense of smell completely. Not Ronnie. Ronnie, in fact, has got a very large hole in her head. It's quite literally one big nostril. Inside that hole are thousands of scent receptors that can pick up the smell of rotting flesh from up to four and a half miles away from her location. So she is able to pinpoint with great accuracy where that food item is and will then circle above it whilst looking on the ground for its exact placement. Now that circling in the sky is a signal to their other vultures that I've found food. They will gather in a huge stacks of what we call a wake. The wake of vultures is them soaring around in the skies above, quite literally alerting each other to uh, the food beneath. You notice she's got a bald head. That's where the turkey bark comes from. She is a turkey vulture because she kind of looks like a turkey. That big black body and the bright, bold pink head. She is bold because vultures are incredibly clean creatures. They bathe after most meals, and she's bold so that the feathers that are, would have been on the top of her head are no longer there to get dirty and gross and covered in those blood and guts inside those carcasses. But there is one thing that she does. I suppose it's a little bit of a tip for you today. Something that will make you, I hope, fall in love with her even more. She may have a bright pink face, but you can also see that her feet are bright white. Now that's a bit unusual because her skin is pink all over. The reason she has white feet is because they're covered in something. As a new world species of vulture, Ronnie partakes in something called urohydrosis which is a really posh way of saying, you poo down your own legs. <laughs> Apparently, it keeps you cool on a hot day as the moisture evaporates from the poop, and it stops the bugs from biting you. So if you're sat there now thinking, God, oh, it's got warm out here, isn't it? Now you know what to do. And I guarantee you we will spot the person who does it because there'll be a big gap in the crowd. <laughs> Vultures on the whole, then, an absolutely incredible family of birds. And I hope that Ronnie stands as an ambassador for species across our planet everywhere. Um, and it just goes to show you how truly amazing they are. We're going to let her do one final flight back over to Ross before she heads back into the van. Give her a round of applause as she heads on over. It's the beautiful Ronnie, our turkey vulture. Now, as Ross prepares the next bird, I just want to tell you a little bit about the sport of falconry. Falconry itself is actually not what we're doing here today. Falconry is the sport of hunting with a trained bird of prey. It's been practiced across the world for, we believe, anywhere between five and 6,000 years. It's been practiced here in the UK for about 1,500 years. So since medieval Britain, this sport has come along leaps and bounds and grown in popularity uh, until more recently, until we've been a bit more aware of how we treat our wildlife uh, and how we don't necessarily need to hunt for our food anymore. So the sport evolved into doing display work and educational work like this. So what we're doing today is we're flying our trained birds of prey using falconry techniques. 
But the sport is age old and the language that we use and the techniques and equipment that we use has come through with it. The leather equipment our birds wear are still made by hand in the same traditional ways that they were thousands of years ago. The only modern bit of kit that they wear now is the radio trackers or the GPS trackers so that if they do disappear we can just look at our phones and know where they are. <laughs> Something that the uh, uh, people throughout history did not necessarily have the joy of doing. Now we have been joined by the beautiful Cleo. Cleo is a Lana falcon, another speed demon but hunting in a completely different style. Certainly more low level, fast action, sort of more bullying technique, I suppose, uh, in terms of how she wants to capture the lure from Ross. The lure, by the way, is again a traditional piece of equipment. If we were training uh, uh, Cleo to, to hunt for us, we would tie the wings of the bird that we wanted her to catch onto the lure, so that as it was being swung, it quite literally represented that prey item. So it could be that uh, if we wanted her to catch uh, small gulls, we use gull wings. If it's pheasant, we use pheasant wings, partridge, partridge wings, and so on. Uh, so it gets her uh, the idea of what it is she wants to catch. She's head straight off over the trees there. Thank you, Ross. That's another one released back to the wild. <laughs> no, again, just like lockdown, she is searching for lift. Now, the thing with Cleo is that Cleo does like to do this slightly further out than lockdown does. So if you thought lockdown went far, uh, far off, uh, then you're about to have a shock with Cleo. Um, now, you notice Ross has put the lure away. There is absolutely no point in standing there spinning a lure whilst your bird is not in sight. Because if you can't see her, then she can't see you. Now, if Ross gets in the van and suddenly starts driving off, that's the time where you have to worry, all right? That means that she's gone too far. But like I say, Ross is able to look at his phone, he's able to say exactly on the map where she is. So Ross, where's your falcon? Somewhere over that way. Excellent. Well, if anybody spots her, give us a shout. I would say we're pretty good at it. Uh, but Ross quite literally has updates on his phone. It's a blue dot that moves around the, uh, the screen of the phone and that is her moving around the skies above us. Um, so, by the way, Cleo has flown here before as well. We were here last year, so this is something that she's not unfamiliar to her. We do a lot of off-site shows with Cleo, and she does a lot of off-site shows away from those shows. <laughs> um, so, and there she is, is that her peeking up over the trees on the far side? Just looking at gaining some height. Look at this, slowly it coming back towards us by the looks of it, but that could turn very quickly um, and, and go off into each other, uh, go off into a different direction, sorry. Now, Ross will continue to swing the lure whenever she is present and can see him in the eye line. She may choose to whistle her, call out to her, anything that gets her attention. Remember, these guys are hunters after all. If you want that bird to come back and hunt you, you have to be desirable. Ross is very much dad to Cleo as well. If I was out here flying Cleo, I can tell you she wouldn't have hung around for even the short amount of time that she did. We would have let her go and she would have disappeared and she wouldn't come back at all. Um, whereas Ross is very much dad, an extremely strong bond, an incredible relationship, mutually beneficial to both. So of course, um, she relies on him for food, and in times gone by, he would rely on her to catch that food for him. Today, it's built on trust. He trusts that when Cleo is set free, she will come back to him eventually, and she trusts that when she does that, there'll be something in it for her some sort of food item on the table. And that's why Ross is continuing to swing the lure. It's not a desperate attempt to get her back, but instead it's showing her, it's luring her back, showing her that there is something in it for her. Still same sort of direction, Ross, over the trees? Yeah, absolutely. So you guys over this way, you might see her popping up and down over the trees as she's in search for height. Now there are lots of different ways that this game of cat and mouse can end that we, we play with our birds. Um, ending number one you saw with lockdown earlier on. If Ross feels that the falcon has done the right amount of work and deserves the reward, he relinquishes the lure, he gives the lure up to the falcon and they take their prize. Sometimes we do that by calling them in and telling them that they can come and get it. 
Sometimes we do this by surprise, so they feel like they've caught us out. Uh, and it means then that they feel that drive to come and catch us again when we fly them again later on. Ending number two is if clear or lockdown touch the lure at any point, then the game is over immediately. They've won fair and square, they've beat us, and the lure is theirs. We never take it away from them. But ending number three is completely different. And this is the one that Cleo likes to do an awful lot. Ending number three is if she goes and plays a completely different game. She doesn't want to play the game with Ross anymore. She wants to go and play a game with the local wildlife. A game that she calls tag. They call it murder. And I imagine that's what she's got off today. She's gone straight down over the woods. You can actually see her over the far tree at the very end. You can see her against the white of the sky and the clouds, keep coming up and down, sort of looking at Ross, checking that she can still see him, and then still looking for whatever it is she could catch down there. Eventually, however, she is likely to track back over. Um, you can see her coming slightly closer now. She's locked on to Ross. The wings are tucked in. She's coming at high speed down this end. Low level right over the tops of your heads. Get ready to duck as she cuts on through. Look at that. Excellent job. And turning immediately to come back in and have another go at Ross in this lure. Cleo knew exactly what she was doing. Hands up if you thought she wasn't coming back. Yep, me too. <laughs> No, I have a full confidence in Ross and his falcons. But you can see how she's able to turn on a sixpence, again using those... God, that shows my age then. I just said turn on a sixpence. Yeah, let's not say that again. Um, but you can see how she's using those different techniques that we mentioned earlier on. Uh, Cleo is an extremely fit falcon. She can make multiple passes. Um, throughout the field here before tiring. Lockdown as the slightly younger falcon couldn't do quite as much work. Love that she came straight under uh, then in, in terms of trying to pursue you. Look at her turning the beautiful silhouette. What are you trying to do Ross? You're trying to take me out? And the lure is hers. Now we do have to be extremely careful with the amount of food that we give our birds here today. So when Ross makes the fair exchange and asks uh, Cleo to step up off of that lure, he will offer her food in the glove. However, we want her to fly again a little bit later on for you at approximately three o'clock. Um, uh, and therefore we can't give her her full meal. The reason we can't give her a full meal because it's after a bird has been fed, it doesn't want to do anything anymore. It actually has done everything it needs to do for that day. So it spends the rest of the day literally sitting down and doing nothing. It feels fed up. So hands up for me, who's felt fed up before? Yeah, if you haven't got your hands up now, you're either lying or you haven't got a soul, all right? Uh, but the reason we use that terminology, we use the phrase fed up, is quite literally because of our work with birds of prey. I am afraid to say though that Cleo was the final bird that we're flying for you here today. So let's not just give all of our birds, but the incredible Ross, a huge round of applause for the display that they've done here today. And we will be back with you uh, at three o'clock-ish this afternoon. We look forward to seeing you there. Enjoy the rest of your day, but for now, goodbye.